Please like and subscribe to our channel and click the bell icon to get new video updates. The most ominous day of the year, if you're becoming a doctor, is July 1st. Once you leave the civilian world behind, the first day of the year is now July 1st. So forget September with Labor Day and the first day of school. Forget January with New Year's Day and resolutions. July 1st is now it. On July 1st, everything turns over in the medical world. So medical students become doctors. They're now interns. Interns become residents. Residents are now fellows. Fellows become attendings. Now, you're not supposed to remark on the bizarreness of being ratcheted up a notch at the stroke of midnight. No. On July 1st, you walk into your untested role, cool as a cucumber, and you act as though the world of June 30th and before never existed. <laughs> or as the interns say, when in doubt, pretend. And so on June 30th, I was a measly medical student. And on July 1st, I was now one of those interns. And so the first day of internship at Bellevue Hospital, on July 1st, all the new interns gather at 7 o'clock in the morning for their one-time only free bagel breakfast and their list of patients. All that was, except me. I had been scheduled to start internship on night float, four weeks straight of night shift only. And so on July 1st, while everyone's at the hospital learning the ropes, I sat at home and worried. And then, at 10 o'clock at night, I walked down First Avenue in the pitch darkness for my first day of internship. Now, night float is supposed to be the direct continuation of medical care from the day teams. But as a night float intern, I had the patient load of four other interns, so this wasn't possible. My beeper never stopped. Mr. Rivera in 19 South needs a new IV. Mr. Soto in 16 East is having chest pain. Mrs. Ahmed in 17 North has a fever. Mr. Halal's daughter here wants to talk to a doctor. Mrs. Rashid fell out of bed. Mrs. Kwan's refusing her meds. Mr. Nolan's having a blood transfusion reaction. Mr. Rivera's IV is out again. And so night float turned out to be 10 hours of damage control. I raced from one ward to the next, patching things up, putting out fires, just hoping to keep everyone alive until the sun came up over the East River and the day teams <laughs> came back. So one night in like my second week of night float, I get paged by my resident around 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. Elba Rodriguez's blood count just dropped 13 points. Get over to 16 North, do a rectal, see if she's bleeding from her gut. Now, you should know that in the human body, there are only a few places where you can bleed briskly enough to drop your hematocrit at 13 points, and the GI tract is the prime suspect. And if you bleed anywhere along that line, from the mouth to the esophagus, stomach, small intestine, large intestine, rectum, there will be traces of blood in the stool. So the way you check for a GI bleed is you get a stool sample, you put it on the card, and you put a few drops of the special developer fluid on it, and if it turns blue, that's blood. And the way you get a stool sample is you send an intern over to do a rectal exam. <laughs> <laughs> and so at this point in my career, I was very adept at taking orders. I didn't ask questions, I did what I was told. Also by this point in my career, I was equipped for anything. My pockets were stuffed with blood tubes and IVs and gauze pads and bandages and surgical tape, tourniquets, you name it. So I strode over to 16 North, crack night float intern, ready for battle. Mrs. Rodriguez was this tiny, wrinkled Dominican woman with layers and layers of family at the bedside. So I walk and say, hi, I'm one of the night docs. I'm not her regular doctor, but I'm just here to do the rectal. And I'm thinking, Dr. Ofri, rectal specialist. <laughs> and so the grandson steps forward. He says, well, we understand what you have to do, doctor. I'm actually a nurse. And if you don't mind, I want to stay with Abuelita while you do the exam. Stay while I do this? And I'm thinking, what is the protocol for this situation? I've been a doctor now for two whole weeks, and I have no idea what to do when the family wants to stay. But I say, OK, well, you know, whatever. So the rest of the family goes out to the hallway. We pull the curtain for some privacy from the other three patients. The grandson and I roll Mrs. Rodriguez onto her left side, and I start disgorging my pockets, the gloves, the lubrication fluid, the test cards. 
and then I realize I'm missing the bottle of developer fluid. So I say to the grandson, can you just hold on for one second? I need to get one more thing. So I dash out of the room, and I avoid the, the gaze of the family members there, and I run to the supply closet and start rifling through the shelves and the bins, no developer fluid. So I race down the hall to 16 West to their supply closet, and of course, none there. All the other interns have pocketed them. The CCU. The cardiac care unit was always well stocked, but I knew the nurses guard their supplies like hawks, so I crept in from the back door of the CCU, <laughs> you know, where they keep the dirty laundry and the used bedpans, and I tiptoe over to the supply shelf, and I start going through the shelves, and there's gauze pads and IV, IVs and blood tubes and culture bottles and glycerin swabs and betadine swabs, and ah, right behind the chest tubes is a single yellow bottle developer fluid and I snatch it just as the nurse yells, hey, those are CCU supplies. I cram it in my pocket and I run out with my head down because from the back, all interns look alike, or so I hoped. So I get back to 16 North and I'm out of breath and I'm flustered and sweaty. And the grandson is still calmly balancing Mrs. Rodriguez on her left side. And so I undo the floral house coat, the cardigan sweater and the patient gown. I get down to her skin. And while I'm doing the exam, like a good nightfall intern, I'm running my scut list in my head. All right, I've got to do those blood cultures on 15 North. I've got to do the chest x-ray to follow up on 17 West. And oh, that guy in 19 South keeps pulling out his IV. And so I'm doing the exam, running the scut list, and the grandson says, I think that Abuelita is no longer with us. <laughs> no longer with us? What was he talking about? With his free hand, the grandson crossed himself and murmured something in Spanish. And I'm still frozen in the middle of the exam. No longer with us? Mrs. Rodriguez is dead? The grandson sighed. Abuelita lived a long and wonderful life. She didn't want any heroic measures or machines. She just wanted to drift off in peace. We just need you to pronounce her dead, doctor, and then we can take her home and I'm staring at the grandson, and my heart is thudding against my chest wall. Dead, dead. Mrs. Rodriguez is dead? Suddenly my mind begins to race. I tear the glove off, and I'm thinking, okay, okay, how do I declare a patient dead? And I'm running through the file cab in my head, thinking, okay, okay, ah, ah. Pupillary reflexes, that's it. So I whip out my handy pen light and I shine into Mrs. Rodriguez's eyes. To my dismay, she has huge cataracts and probably wouldn't have had reflexes anyway. Okay, okay. Respirations, dead people do not breathe. And so I whip out my stethoscope. By now the family is filtered in from the hallway and they gather around and watch as I put in one earpiece and the other and I plant the bell on her chest and suddenly a twitch vibrates through her body and I jump it back. Was this rigor mortis or might she still be alive? It suddenly dawns on me that we never had a lecture in medical school on how to declare a patient dead. I guess it was assumed to be pretty obvious. Dead is dead. And if you're not dead, then you're alive, right? Um, um, pulse, pulse, that is it. Dead people for sure do not have a pulse. And so I run my fingers along her left carotid and then along her right. Of course, the only way you know you found the pulse is when you found the pulse. <laughs> How do you document the absence of something when its presence is defined by hunting until you found it? Maybe I was in the wrong spot. Maybe I'm pressing too hard and not hard enough. Was so I supposed to go over her entire body to document the absence of a pulse? Another twitch runs through Mrs. Rodriguez's body and the family is staring at me, waiting for an answer. But how can I say anything? What if I got it wrong? Okay, okay. An EKG, that's it. If I get a flat line on the EKG, nobody could argue with that. So I run out and get the EKG machine and wheel it back in these old decrepit EKG machines that Bellevue had. You know, all the leads are tangled up, and these old machines have these red rubber suction cups to put on the chest. And when you squeeze them, 
Electro jelly from EKGs gone by slithers out in crusted blue clumps. And Mrs. Rodriguez, the skinny little woman, doesn't have much bulk on her chest for the suction cups to stay onto. So I'd squeeze one on, and another one would pop off. And so I'd apply more jelly and put it on, another one would pop off, back and forth. And the family is like watching like a tennis match, back and forth as I'm <laughs> chasing down the obstreperous suction cups. Finally, finally, I get the EKG set up. All the chest leads, all the limb leads, and I press the start button. And we all stare at this skinny strip of graph paper that's sneaking out of the EKG machine, and I'm praying for something definitive. It emerges with completely unreadable squiggles. Between the rattling air vents and three IV pumps the next bed over, I can't get a stable baseline. And I readjust the leads, and two more suction cups pop off. The grandson curls his hand around his grandmother's wrists and he says, she's dead, doctor. You don't have to do any more tests. The family joins hands and begins to pray in Spanish. And I'm standing there with EKG jelly crusted under my fingernails, my white coat chafing at my hot and sweaty neck, burning with embarrassment. How could I not figure out whether or not Mrs. Rodriguez was dead? Isn't that what doctors do? Pronounce the time of death? How could I ever be a doctor if I couldn't tell a dead person from a live one? <laughs> how, how could there exist so much to be ignorant of? When were these magical medical skills going to materialize? And what was I going to write on the death certificate as the immediate cause of death? The sun came up over the East River as it always does, even after the longest, hardest night of night float. And as I'm signing out to the day teams, I'm thinking about Mrs. Rodriguez. And I imagine her as a young woman, a fresh immigrant right off the boat to New York. And maybe she came to Bellevue every year for her annual checkup. Maybe she had her children at Bellevue. Maybe she thought she would die at Bellevue. Maybe her ghost was already wandering the halls of the old Bellevue brick buildings, along with the other ghosts of all the New Yorkers that Bellevue hospitals cared for for nearly three centuries. Wherever she was, I hoped she forgave me for the indignity she suffered at the hands of an inexperienced intern. You know, night float can feel like it never ends, but it does. It ends when you sign out to the day teams and then you click off your beeper which is one of the sweetest sounds known to humankind. And then you get to go home. It's the end of the day. Now, most of us, when we go home at the end of the day, it's the end of the day. The light is falling, twilight's coming, dusk. But when you work at night, the end of the day, it's brilliant morning sun. And I did night float the month of July. And so it was so bright. I remember I would go home every morning like this with my eyes covered. And when I look back at that time now, I realized that I spent so much of my medical training with my eyes closed. Medicine, learning medicine is so internally focused, cramming in all those facts, all those diseases. I always had my head in a book. But one of the things about becoming a doctor is that you need to open your eyes. You need to open your eyes to the world around us, to the experiences that teach us medicine. It's seeing that teachers are everywhere and not just our professors and our books, but the nurses, the aides, the techs, the clerks, the housekeepers, the guys who push the gurneys. But our truest teachers are our patients and their families, whose lives and experiences we are so, so privileged to be a part of. Thank you.